So, hello and good morning, everyone. I'm happy that you're all here. And I would love to mention that this talk is recorded via audio. I must on the Bildschirm freigeben wieder. Is that freigeben on Bildschirm? No. It's recorded via audio and video and will be uh, made accessible via Vimeo. Um, I will speak to Sian Reed in the next 30 minutes, and then we will um, also open for Q&A if somebody on Facebook has some questions. But you can also like comment on the talk on Facebook, like I think Severin, you are like moderating the chat on Facebook, right? So if there is an urgent question, you can also post it and then Severin will forward it to me who is sitting opposite of me. Um, but first of all, maybe uh, before I introduce uh, Sian, I want to give a, I, I welcome you, Sian, already, Sian David. But first, I want to. <laughs> happy to first, be here. Yeah, happy to have you here. Um, I want to give a short introduction about uh, the exhibition, the works of Sian Finds themselves in it's also like where I'm sitting right now in the exhibition like the works of Sienna behind me and also about the place where we and the artworks find themselves in so in so my name is Petra Pölzler I should also probably mention that and I'm the artistic and managing director of Neue Galerie Innsbruck and Kunstpavillon I took up this position approximately a year ago and the current exhibition entitled Pleasure Activism is the first thematic exhibition that I'm curating here. The title of the exhibition stems from a book that is called Pleasure Activism. It is written by Adrian Marie Brown. She's a black feminist and human rights fighter and female rights fighter and she um, suggests a politics of pleasure or an activism of pleasure to escape the oppression several marginalized, marginalized groups are suffering from, to make them visible, to name them, to discuss them, but not like follow the structure or the rules of oppression, of power and oppression. Um, but rather um, encounter them with with a certain kind of pleasure. And so do the, the works in the ex exhibition. Sophia Süßmilch, Anne Duke Jordan, Sian Derit, and Ariel Efre im Aspel, whose work all create fields of imagination and possibility that invite us to immerse ourselves in new ways of seeing, thinking, and maybe even acting. Um, as a next point, I would briefly like to speak about the location of the gallery, which is part of the huge architecture of the Imperial, Imperial Palace in Innsbruck. It used to serve as the, I wanna share my, my screen with you so you can see the building. Sorry. Uh, um, this is the Imperial Palace of Innsbruck and you can see like here, like here is the gallery two more windows going to here and I'm sitting here right now <laughs> and it's the house of Habsburg well as a side note the house of Habsburg also officially called the house of Austria was most one of the most influential and distinguished royal houses of Europe although from the 16th century the dynasty was split between its Spanish and Austrian branches and ruled distinct territories they nevertheless maintained close relations and frequent, frequently intermarried. So it was that the Philippines, where C and Dairit finds himself on at the moment, were named after Philip II of Spain, a member of the House of Habsburg, of the House of Austria. He commenced settlements in the Philippines, and it was during his time that numerous, numerous Filipinos were put into mass executions, unpaid labor, and other colonial abuses while indigenous cultures were destroyed. And as I would argue, that's exactly where the work of the artist C. and Derrit takes its beginning. Uh, as in his work, he argues fiercely for the necessity of the inclusion of the narratives of land, landscape, and territories. Derrit's cartographic artworks embroidered on textiles or painted over collages of colonial era maps 
block the extraction of natural resources, land grabbing and dispossession. At the same time, their resistant lines uh, create new imaginaries out of the overlaps between places and memories. They remind viewers how empires caught out the borders of the modern world and how its aftermath, aftermath perpetuates industrial development while inviting us to reconsider the ways in which we spatially perceive and interpret the world. I took the short introduction from an interview um, uh, um, Sian gave with Berlin Artling, which I thought this short abstract was like pretty fitting with what you're doing. Um, let me go on a little bit longer. Dairit studied painting at the University of the Philippines. His works has been exhibited in international biennials, such as the currently ongoing Guangzhou Biennial, the Berlin Biennial for Contemporary Art, the Dhaka Art Summit in Bangladesh, the New Museum Triennial in New York, as well as the Goethe Book Biennial. Darit has also participated in exhibitions at Parasite in Hong Kong, Hammer Museum in A, the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Museum of Manila, and the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw, as well as the Neue Galerie in Innsbruck. Uh, in 2019, he was an artist in residence at Gasworks in London. So that was all that I was wanted to talk about or give us an introduction. So, ah, no, thanks to Norm Gallery. I also wanted to say thanks to Luca and Olga for lending the works and having such a great conversation with them and such an easy handling. That's also what I wanted to say in the beginning. But now do you see on the read? How are you? Hey. Where are you at the moment? All right, the question <laughs> you've been <laughs> wanting to ask. Hey, so I'm in... I'm in the Philippines. Um, I'm currently in La Union, which is a province north of Manila, um, mm -hmm. by the coast. Um, so it's it's actually a residency that where I'm in, um, in Surf Town. So it's a very touristy part of the Philippines, which is also kind of eerie to be in, considering like the the pandemic that's going on. But I find this place to be some sort of a um like a bubble not like primarily in a bad way but then it's sort of like a gives you space to um not just surf and sort of party but <laughs> also to comp <laughs> contemplate um certain like positionalities of uh, of comfort and privilege but mm -hmm. at the same time to also be a good place to to have more critical eyes and and to look into like um um spaces and like uh, moments of access and and non-access mm -hmm. so um so yeah this is where i'm at currently um specifically i'm in the room of the hostel where i'm staying in while i'm also babysitting my kids and my neighbor's kids um but then i guess that's that's really very much part of the reality of of, of what we do um, um i was hearing uh the introduction a while ago and like uh enumerating certain like um, like exhibitions I've participated in in different institutions but I guess I also um, would like to point out that that's just like a like a part of, of, of uh, what we do not just as artists not just as cultural workers but also as as, as members of society <laughs> and then and finding our place within like um, um, the, the the larger conditions that dictate, um, not uh, different uh, sectors of the population. Um, so um, uh, you were mentioning a bunch of uh, like museums and biennales that I um, have participated in and am currently participating in. But I guess like also notable, um, or at least like I, I try to have my work also be present outside of the gallery system or the institutions and be part of a more everyday life and to sort of like um, um, see how cultural work can bleed into the rest of um, our daily lives with its e economics and politics as well. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll sort of, we're just gonna be um, like talking more about this as the conversation goes along. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I thought about like structuring the conversation like that to first speak about the works briefly that are here in the exhibition. Then I thought course, like yeah. that yeah. the works at the Berlin Biennial are 
like more detailed or more precise in what they are what they are mentioning or what they are showing and then i wanted to go into the workshops and your work as an activist and the question if maybe your artistic practice is like a byproduct of the actual activist work you're doing like that would be the question for for the end but i mean we can also yeah. start with the end but maybe for the audience who is maybe not familiar with your work it would be good to start yeah. with the yeah we'll go with that yeah yeah okay yeah. but then okay. i make <laughs> um uh yeah here is uh your your work like the title of this talk is called the headline of this talk is called we move among ghosts and vision and counter um cartography so uh, like developing counter counter cartographies and the counter mapping is in that is a technique that you are applying a lot in your artistic work not only but actually uh, yeah there are several works also especially this we move among ghosts mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and there you are embroidering um the underrepresented or unwritten narratives of indigenous people who have been at the forefront of the liberation struggles to escape Western colonialism and imperialist plundering. Hence, you take the prevailing focus of the white supremacist away and uh, shift it towards the to one of the colonized, the marginalized communities to debunk the hegemonic powers to, to debunk hegemonic power structures. Um, perhaps you could tell us more about the research process involved to reach knowledge about this much and much sorry marginalized <laughs> groups yeah. and how yeah. to how you create these counter narrations. And I can also imagine there is some risks or form of exposures that might yeah. be involved in this process by yeah. translating this process or this research into artworks and yeah that's a lot of words yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i make it <laughs> yeah yeah sure 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 but all I... right <laughs> no no it's okay it's okay um i'll just sort of um like head straight at it i guess like <laughs> um i guess like uh, broadly speaking uh, a lot or if not all my practice is about challenging dominant narratives and usually i look into or reference um, different images or objects or institutions that somehow dictate or or position themselves within uh, a seat of power so um, primarily i was interested in in how museums would function as educational systems that dictate narratives uh, uh, that dictate heritage and culture and identity. And I found that to be like a very powerful um, place for all of that to happen, you know, as a, uh, as a young, like um, student, I guess, like walking into these spaces and being told that this is your ancestors and this is where you came from. And and all of these like uh, pronouncements. And then like, I was pretty much like a, equally horrified and and entranced with, um, with with that moment of being in there and being told who you are um and then from there i was like fascinated with how such a space could uh, deliver such a strong message and shape um, an individual or better yet like a population and then like like focusing on 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 similar sort of uh, um, objects or institutions like i was also um, fascinated with with how monuments and eventually maps and how these are all sort of like a parallel um, parallel structures that function the same way you know in in, in the uh, in the guise or or in the service of nation building but then I eventually sort of uh, got into questioning what what this what these ideas mean like nation and power uh, and and identity who sort of a like a who dictates one's identity so um i got into looking and using maps by uh, sort of uh, immersing myself in some archives in metro manila um in the i had an exhibition at a museum called the lopez museum and library wherein i was um, looking into its collection, like its cartographic collection, which um, 
which was a vast collection of um, of uh, of maps, but mostly like a uh, colonial maps. I was interested in in not just like in its like design and aesthetic, but also like its its power, sort of like an encapsulated into this idea of artifact um, that it wasn't just like it was barely representing space because like our the the actual representations of space had evolved um, especially with the contemporary technology of cartography and how we use like a gps and all but then i was uh, like fascinated with how they are actually like very political objects that like um, displayed power of what was once if you will because um it, wasn't only like telling us like how the space looked like but like the um like basically who was in charge at, at the time at that point in history um so from there i was looking into like just like what are the more like contemporary views on how um maps um are are, are used or understood and then other than like the more technological advancement, but then how can we sort of like um, engage with this format, quite like he hegemonic format, um, to talk about like more more of uh, the struggles and narratives of people who are usually excluded in, in these maps. And then from there, I was pretty much just consulting with uh, some friends who were geographers um, and then they sort of just told me about the idea of counter cartography and how like this is actually like a, uh, a basically a, a practice to subvert um, the format of maps and the format and gestures of maps to to push forward progressive goals. Mm -hmm. um, and in others, in 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 another sense, it also like counters the traditional notions of cartography, which is always authored by the state or from positions of power. Yeah. Um, of yeah. Um, so from there, I was trying to look for ways on how like because like I guess like I'm an artist primarily, so I was trying to look for ways on how I can I I can make work um, to talk about how these objects can be subverted, uh, much like how I was always thinking of work. Um, about how monuments can be subverted or museums can be subverted. Um, I guess like an, an underlying um, theme within my practice as an artist is to subvert um, subvert symbols of power, um, like in a broad sense, I guess. So like um, pretty much just playing around with with what counter mapping is, was, is, or what could be. Um, and like I've always, sort of um, just play the role as an outsider in terms of the different practices that I look into um, from like as an artist playing around with archaeology or an artist playing around with 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 geography and cartography mm -hmm. uh, but I guess like I, I also like this this positionality of being some sort of a shapeshifter mm -hmm. um, but also recognizing the idea that it's not enough to just Sort of be playing around with different, uh, with different languages. Um, it's also important to um, actually engage and and be some sort of of a channel mm -hmm. to to different narratives that I'm actually just borrowing in my work. Um, specifically, see, uh, speaking, like um, I'm actually putting to the fore, at least like in my idea, um, the narratives and struggle of, of peasants and indigenous people and workers and urban poor um, in the Philippines. Um, but then at the same time, finding the parallels and then the, the similarities within the struggles of all of those sectors, and not just in the Philippines, but in the rest of Southeast Asia. Yeah, this, or, or the Global South in general. The Global South, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, so I guess like um, trying to sort of like learn uh, as directly as possible from the people mm -hmm. and um, sort of uh, gearing my own like radar and understanding and ideologies and, and, and solidarities to, to sectors which I am not exactly part of, but I guess like being like a middle class petty bourgeois uh filipino city kid <laughs> um um i identify actually with with 
coming from a position of privilege and power more mm-hmm. than being being uh, uh, being a farmer or or yeah, a of member of a national minority. Um, so so I'm interested in sort of like a breaking or sort of a subverting that ground as well into like deliberately um, deliberately. Um, turning my art into gestures of solidarity with the mm-hmm. uh, more marginalized classes. So the knowledge mm-hmm. to that you're bringing into this mm-hmm. into this um, embroidery comes from like speaking to geographers, looking into archives, looking into colonial maps, and also speaking to the people who who are the indigenous people who are facing mm-hmm. who like, yeah. right now still this mm-hmm. colonial. Yeah. Precisely. So, um, other than me, myself as an artist referencing like history or archives or these objects, I think like um, it's important to to note that like as, well as much as I can, as as much as I like work on, like I try to um, I try to reference and sort of um, transmit, if you will. The narratives of the people from themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is also a role that um, we have to sort of constantly um, try to make consistent of. Um, so, in that sense, I also could say that I like um, subscribe to sort, for example, like alternative media sources, um, and then uh, different. Um, different uh, data or narratives from um, human rights organizations mm-hmm. or or other like peasant or indigenous people advo- people's advocates um, um, yeah i mean there is like now so many names written on it and uh, also there is some sentences written in dagalog also like yeah. it is the most known or used language on the, on the philippines right so maybe you can like uh, tell us what's written here in Tagalog. I would be really yeah. interested in it. And also sure. like as an example, I don't know, maybe here it's written like the Igorots. Um, I don't know, just a short, maybe in, uh, yeah, in a short sum up, like what is written right. because we, we as the Western audience mm-hmm. does not really understand the language. So I would be interested in that. All right, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> did you just give sweets to the kids no what was no that? no i was handed over a piece of paper and uh, okay. like, i'll get back to you <laughs> all right okay so okay so um there's a lot of like uh, angles um on how to view this piece um i guess like as a yes it is written in tagalog um tagalog is the language of the region where uh state is in like this is the tagalog region where manila is in mm-hmm and then other provinces that speak the language. So I wouldn't say um, it is representative of, of all the regions, but then it had become an imposed, an imposed uh, mother tongue. So people within the Mindanao or some of the Visayas regions, they would actually quite refuse to accept Tagalog as uh, a mother tongue because they have their own languages. Um, so the Philippine archipelago, um, the one, like, like I don't have access to a mouse, but then if you, if you're familiar with the Philippine archipelago, it's a, it's about like seven thousand six hundred islands with several ethno linguistic um, communities. Tagalog being Tagalog in in the Tagalog region being the supposedly dominant one because like state is there, but then like um, there are for example in the Mindanao region regions there are different here um, right yeah no no, no. higher, oh, okay. higher. That, that's oh, okay. malaysia and indonesia uh, okay oh wow oh yeah right, yeah right. No. where moro and luma yeah, here is yeah, yeah 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 i knew that's in the south but it was yeah. a little bit too powerful yeah yeah, yeah. Mindanao region. so um there's like a variety of uh bisaya languages so um i guess like um it, given the term indigenous, um, it, it may strike or it, it's very different coming from the Philippines wherein we're all somehow indigenous. Mm-hmm. Um, even if, even if um, like a part of your lineage is like Chinese or American or Spanish. Um, I'm not sure if this is the time to give like a, like a history lesson of, of what the Philippines is. Um, but then I guess that's a background of um, 
Tagalog, which now actually I'm trying to think why I use Tagalog. Um, Tagalog itself being somewhat of a dominant language that sort of imposes itself on the rest of the regions. But I guess um, I'm just being mindful of like where I'm coming from. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, and it's sort of like um, in one of the texts, it actually um, tries to express solidarity from where I'm from. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But what's so, written here? Also, what's like written all right. here? So in the, in the upper left is a title cartouche. It says, Mga Kapuluan ng Timog Silangang Asia at ilang mga katutubong grupo. Um, some islands of Southeast Asia and some indigenous groups. All right. So it's a very vague title, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not a like islands of Southeast Asia and some indigenous groups. Um, I guess like I'd want to sort of say that um, it's very difficult to to name everything. Um, and it's not, I guess it's also not within the function of this particular work. Um, but then it's more of like to, to give like a, a general grouping of different uh, communities um, may it be based on like ethnolinguistics or 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 g- genetical uh, genetical origins, but um, wanting to give like a like an on the surface sort of like a, a call roll call uh, of different um, minorities, if you will, um, mm-hmm. because like I said, like I'm coming from um, an archipelago wherein we're all somewhat indigenous. Um, we don't refer to ethno-linguistic groups as indigenous people, but more of like minorities because excluded would be more dominant ethno-linguistic groups like, mm-hmm. um, like, like Tagalogs or myself yeah. but uh, or the larger Visaya framework. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, but these groups but, are also yeah. like still existing, right? For example, of course, of the course. Igorots in the north, they are yeah, yeah. still there and they are currently also suffering from losing yeah. the lands, I guess, right? Yeah, because... okay. So, basically, um, the ones that I have mentioned in, uh, in, in the map of the Philippines, if you can see the Igorot at the top, and then the Aita, and then the Dumagat, and the Agta, um, and then the Mangyan, and then the Ati. Um, so those are some some of the like major subgroups of national minorities. So for example, the Aitas and the Dumagats and the Agtas and then the Ati and some of the Lumad, for example, are are part of a larger like a I guess linguistic and maybe genetic um, like a origin as to the Orang orang Aslis or the Orang Manuvur or the Orang Ulu all the way up to the aborigines of, uh, of Australia. Mm-hmm. So everything is pretty much like either genetically or linguistically interconnected with the, the others. And then um, going through and across the borders defined by nationhood, you know. So I guess by, by putting some of these like um, blanket blanket names it's sort of also trying to um, show the the parallels and then the similarities not just in genetics and linguistics but also the struggle um, that different communities across islands across continents um, share so yeah actually um so there the most of the most of the national minorities in the philippines these are like um, uh, they exclude like the bigger, the bigger like language groups such as Tagalog, Kapampang, and Visaya. They make up about like 15, 15 or so percent of the population. But then most of them are within the the, the larger uh, percentage of the population that falls within the peasantry or food mm-hmm. producers, you know? mm-hmm. uh, because like um, they're pretty much I mean, other than them taking care of their um, ancestral lands, their 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 indigenous ancestral lands. They're also part of um, they're also part of uh, like the food producer uh, sector, which makes up about like um, seventy or so percent of the population. So I guess when I mention national minorities or indigenous people, I'm also 
um, I'm also mentioning the struggles of uh, of peasants. Mm -hmm. Excuse There's, me, like the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No, I don't. I, the kids don't yeah. bother me. I'm, I'm just like right. really realizing how how complex um, yeah, yeah. and how much knowledge mm -hmm. we find behind or in these maps. You know, like yeah, mm -hmm. like especially for a Western. Um, viewer i mean we we know each other we talked to, we know each other like because i went to the philippines on the residency with the good institute and we met and so i, I have a little bit uh, a clue about what's going on on the philippines but mm -hmm. yeah just asking these questions i realize it, it opens a lot of topics that yeah yeah i've actually um, yeah sorry i yeah i've actually have to sort of uh figure out like in what angle do i want to talk about indigeneity but then like like largely speaking it's within um their struggle for land hold on excuse mm -hmm. me i'm gonna like ask me <laughs> i'm sorry okay it's a number one it's fine <laughs> all right but maybe you um, can yeah. um elaborate a bit about like um um the handcraft of embroidering like i know that it was like in muslim muslim society it was a sign of high social status like mm -hmm. why did you choose that handcraft to produce the maps okay um <laughs> no 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 no, yeah, no problem <laughs> going into the like the the, not the kind of the technicals of it um so I'm I'm putting the maps into these like these large large ish, or not so large actually. It's kind of manageable, like textile and then embroidered. But I'm not act, I'm actually not. I I was never referencing any traditional weaving or textile or fabric practice from the Philippines. If anything, I'm actually referencing like a more European kind of of a um, tapestry presentation. Um, which I guess is also goes back to the idea of, of subverting like like large objects of power. You know, I, I really enjoy how like majestic and imposing these large medieval tapestry maps would sort of a, like a, a demand from its audience. So I was trying to sort of a, like in a way mock that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then so so I've been I've been like uh, collaborating with this embroiderer for the past couple of years now. And then we've, we've been sort of uh, just been trying to like see what, what is possible with this sort of format. Um, but then I guess I like the idea that I like the idea that we're, um, we're sharing like uh, inputs, we're sharing inputs here. Um, sorry, I'm losing track because I'm trying to show the weekends. Focus here. <laughs> guys, 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 come on. Quiet, please. <laughs> All right. Um, no, but it's an yeah. interesting approach because I think for a Western viewer, it's maybe also this kind of um, native handicraft feeling a person might get. I mean, I don't want to also, wanna yeah. stereotype anyone, Yeah, I was getting but... into that point. I was getting okay. into that point. All right. So basically, like, I wanted to make, like, large, pretty things, you know, that talk about... Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to talk. I wanted to make like like large and pretty so things. Yeah, that would talk about like contradictions within within the presentation of these large pretty things. Basically, mm -hmm. um, they were actually just copying, trying to simulate the majesty of European textile maps, but then. The, the the narratives of which I'm trying to foreground in in my 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 mockery of the tapestry tradition is actually of the struggles of the people, um, particularly for liberation and self determination. Um, hence the the banner the, the the line there that says "Lupang ninuno depensahan ipaglaban" like in the top center, yeah. Uh, Lupang Minun, Ninuno is ancestral land, depend, sahans, defend, ipaglaban, fight for. It's actually a, 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 a protest chant, which is mm -hmm. chanted by, like, by the, the national minorities and advocates of the national minorities. Um, so it, by, by putting this chant, these words in here, it, it actually directly adapts into a more militant uh, approach trying to trying to fit this language into into the platforms in which this object i made 
would usually fall into, like galleries and museums, which um, may be also an echo chamber for these kinds of narratives. So, like I said, like um, like uh, as you said a while ago in the introduction, like sometimes I see my work as a byproduct of the of the research and solidarity. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I have been saying that actually within the past month or so. Um, but other than me saying that, it's me trying to keep myself in check, no? Um, because also I recognize, like, I don't know, like sometimes I make something in art. Mm -hmm. Like, where does it go other than, um, where does it go other than the institutions? Yeah, and yeah, that, exactly. That's why, like, I, I believe in, like, the programs such as this, and we get to sort of, like, thresh out ideas and... Mm -hmm. uh, um, so going back to sorry, what was the question? There is, my, my, yeah, my God, I think I there is a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there is a question on Facebook that Severin oh, is okay. just writing down, but it seems to be a really long question. Wow. Well, huh? All right. Wait a second, Siam. Yeah. What? Sure. Ah, so it's in the chat. Okay. Wait. Oh, it's in the chat of Zoom. It's in the chat of Zoom. How do I look into the chat of Zoom? Here it's yeah. F and A, but I. Mm. Oh, there, there, there. Shut okay, I first have to stop. Okay, why are you using embroidery rather than drawing? I think embroidery in the Philippines is a very important oh. source of income. Can you, so can you read it? Can you, can you read it slowly? Oh, so okay. everybody hear it. <laughs> I, I <can't>. okay. Oh. <laughs> okay, so there's one that says, um, these maps also remind me of like old maps about how Western countries have their antique globes with a mythical anthropocentric design. Yes, um, I do actually respond to that um, aesthetic as well of uh, like antiquarian colonial maps wherein there are sea monsters um, placed to sort of depict like the unknown or like danger or what is not to be seen. I find these to be very um, like clever and insidious uh, mapping uh, mapping motifs that somehow impose like a uh, knowledge that is to be shared or not to be shared <laughs> um so so yeah it actually um this this map is referenced from a dutch map from the 1400s if i'm not mistaken i like the the original map uh, escapes me but like it wasn't really important for me which one is which um so yeah um, there's a question saying why are, are you using embroidery rather yeah. than drawing? Yeah, um, I, think I think embroidery in the Philippines is a very important source of income. So I thought there might be a more specific reason why he uses embroidery. Okay, um, yeah, um, I guess like I'm coming from like a contemporary art practice approach. I mean, other than like art being somewhat of my livelihood, I guess I don't exactly um base my choice of of um medium or format on like what is an important source of income but there is actually like a, a textile tradition in different provinces like i'm currently in within the ilocos region in the north northern philippines and then there is um there is an immense like a weaving tradition here but I guess like it's also a talk for another day, I guess, in terms of like industry and craft and how this is co-opted by by capitalist agendas. Actually, very recently in the lockdown, um, uh, there's a big spike of online shopping. And then there's been some online sellers so selling um, traditional Filipino like textiles weavings but then they eventually found out that they were like fake ones from china so like even chinese would do like fake uh, local handicrafts here so there was it's a pretty interesting uh dynamic which will we should sort of all look into in terms of like what what is authenticity but what is mm -hmm. like the co-optation of culture right yeah. uh within the within the agendas of of profit so yeah yeah, thanks um, for answering these yeah. questions. They are sure, right. sure. Um, maybe we, um, um, Sibling, can you keep us one. telling if there is more yeah. questions coming in? Yeah. Um, because maybe we go to the next, or do you want to add something more? Sure, no, it's okay, I guess. Like, yeah, I realize that the time's like really passing fast and I'm just rambling, so I hope. Oh, wow, <laughs> it's 42 yeah. already. Oh my gosh, right. we are just um, coming yeah. to work number two. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's how it goes, no? <laughs> All right. Work number um, two. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> it's adver adversus contradictoris one and two. Um, that um, is actually a work that is um, has uh, three parts, right? But there were mm -hmm. we are explaining two, and it's like embroidered on red fabric. The work shows symbols from the anting anting, which stand next to imaginary iconographics from the Lat from and Latin terms such as patronata or naturalista. Um, I would say that in this work you are bringing together the animalistic belief system, the spiritual... Animistic. Animistic. Yeah. Oh, did I say animalistic? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Animistic. Could be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Awkward. Yeah. Animistic, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, belief system with the arrival of the Spaniards in the mm -hmm. year 1521 who brought mm -hmm. in the Roman Catholicism. Uh -huh. And kind of, um, yeah, I mean, I think there is a kind of religious syncretism now in the Philippines, which merges yeah, yeah, this yeah, animistic yeah. ritual, anim animistic, yeah, not yeah. animalistic, animistic yeah. rituals with the Roman Catholicism. And I want uh -huh. to ask you to tell us more about, sure. also by looking in these works, what are the symbols sure. of the anting anting? I know that, I mean, I, also this morning, I, I found this book in my, I, I will leave it also here in the gallery. Oh yeah, all right, yeah. It's an amazing book, You Shall Be God's Anting Anting and the Filipino Quest for Mystical Power. Do you know it? Yeah, I do. Yeah, it might be if we would be a live talk, then I would hand it out now so people could look into it. But maybe you okay. can, anyways, um, sure, talk a sure. bit about the Anting Anting and the power it has also okay. in on the contemporary Philippines. Okay. Um, I wouldn't know its actual power in contemporary Philippines. It's something like a thing of the old days. Mm -hmm. um, but then we actually do, um, like maybe outside of the city, or maybe it's, it has become somewhat of a subculture to, to, to subscribe to, um, to different faith practices that use anting antings. But then anting antings literally means talisman, and talisman can be anything, or, or like a, or, or, or like a, a lucky charm, if you will. Um, so I guess, like broadly speaking, it's something related to like a quasi-religious belief system that one sort of holds um, near to be like an intimate object. So the the images and the text in in these two works are actually like made up. Like I made them. Um, it's more of like I'm referencing their original, uh, their aesthetic, and then their original compositions. Um, usually, they would be drawn on on vestments that would be worn like underneath. Um, yeah, it's believed to. Right? Yeah, but they um, are also believed, like tattooed on bodies, right? Yeah, sometimes they are tattooed on bodies, or sometimes they are cast in little like a uh, brass. Uh, yeah, brass uh, or wooden amulets that are worn uh, around the neck, uh, among other formats of, of what any talisman or charm could be. You know? mm -hmm. But these ones in particular are pretty much um, referencing from the Filipino anting anting, which um, mixes a lot of, um, um, I guess, like a folk Catholic and kind of Kabbalistic and different sort of a, it's a it's the mix of different uh, um, visual cues, uh, which I find to be very much definitive of like of um, Filipino colonial or post colonial or or semi colonial culture as well, which 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 takes from different uh, um, contexts and and uh, and meanings. Um, I like to run words through Google Translate into Latin and sort of play around with bad translation mm -hmm. of words. So most of these, uh, some of the words are actually, um, yeah, Google translated words, uh, spelling out like accumulation by dispossession uh, and then power. So for example, as an example, um, so these two works are playing around with the idea of patronage. Um, Adversaris contradictoris is facing contradictions. Um, so, so these two works are actually like a, talking about 
patronage not just in culture but in also like in in politics so originally they were supposed to be shown in this um gallery owned by uh, uh gallery in new york uh, owned by a, a philippine collector and also a well-known um surgeon who who, uh, who was also very influential in in politics and as an example like okay. when the when the when the first lady of a former dictator was uh, charged for for graft and plunder um the this doctor art collector said that she was too old and too sick to go to prison and then charges were dropped and the files were totally forgotten so like it became actually like a a hindrance for for justice to be brought so um mm -hmm. and and interestingly enough like the name of that gallery is pinto so which means door that's why i put a doorway on one of the one okay. of the yeah yeah in in one of the central like pieces and then in the words at, at the bottom is latin for like the true the good and the beautiful because that's like the motto of the first lady of the former dictator so there's a lot of these 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 uh and then, and then underneath is like like in fair mum and free like something and free like you know like strong and free healthy and free <laughs> or sick and free sick and free because she's free because she's sick so basically like it's all just like like shade or or, or mockery or, or actually like anger turned into humor turned into talisman <laughs> okay oh, yeah, I get so it. yeah so these these are actually full of like um jokes and sort of like uh um and sort of words that are somewhat incantations to point out the contradictions of patronage mm. in 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 our society i mm -hmm. guess yeah I, I like how i said that um so, <laughs> <laughs> so there are like these four 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 angels like like archangels at the, the at the bottom corners like the patron, the naturalist, the doctor, and the philanthropist, mm -hmm. the philanthropist. These are actually like personas. Uh, like, uh, yeah, no, the person. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, like, like a ghost. No, ha 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 is like laughing, who who is like crying. And then there's ah, this thing with okay. like laughing and crying because you, you're going crazy pretty mm -hmm. much. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, I mean, mm -hmm. that's what I was trying to say. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah. you know the, the patron, the naturalist, the doctor, the philanthropist was pretty much like personas that that um, that that doctor, that particular doctor art collector, um, it, uh, like wears. Um, so yeah, it, it's a lot of these little um, anecdotes in in local in in the local culture and local scene. But I guess but like I, I I like to put it this way. Mm -hmm. in a way because it's it sort of talks about like like maneuvering within positions of power like facing mm -hmm. contradictions you know there at the right one there's an image there are images on top with the dragon and the eagle uh which are recurrent elements in some of my work the dragon talks about china the eagle talks about the u.s yes and then like they're both sort of like battling each other <laughs> with a globe and then underneath it's just the fire yeah with you know like people in the house so, i mean but that's pretty sad but yeah. having said the um, uh, the battle between china and the us maybe it's a good uh, bridge to go to the work Terra rationarium sure yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah and where you oh, wait. Oh. there we go no? yeah. there you go yeah 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 so, uh, so um this is basically an assembly i mean um i work with a lot of like junk other than those nice embroideries <laughs> so so i don't know maybe it's a thing here to just be hoarding little trinkets but then i like to sort of a uh, place the trinkets to somehow give meaning or like to have some sort of coherent um logic into them there are rational like, it's like when we look at these ones, it's like, I don't know, I see the impact of China, the impact of the USA, of global yeah. brands, of the canned yes, food, precisely. But also of the Spanish, and also yeah. the, the militarization, the drug politics of today, that it's like all comes. Yeah. So um, all of all of the above, yes. <laughs> you said it. Um, basically, Terra Rationarium is like inventory of the land, you know? Mm -hmm. So there are five panels there, which I shape to be like a like a house uh, maybe i just wa was wanting to say that 
Oh, so yeah. Like all these issues are have become domestic. You know, this is what mm -hmm. happens like within our own walls. Mm -hmm. um, and then each panel has some somewhat of an, an overarching theme. For example, the one on the leftmost that we're seeing now sort of talks about the exploitation of land for for profit in terms of um, like the ag the entrance and of uh, agri business plantations run owned and owned by foreign multinationals to make crops, cash crops yeah. such as oil palm or sugar cane or banana or pineapple. Um, they may not always be um, owned by foreign multinationals on the, the landed ruling elite. So there's this dynamic of like of peasantry being the most but then the poorest of our it's society. The but especially then especially on Negros, right? The sugar cane. Uh, Negros Island, Island is yes. known for its yeah, yeah, for for its sugar plantations. But before it became a sugar plantation island, it was a tobacco plantation island. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um so oh that was in Panaypala, sorry. But then, yeah, but anyway, that is pretty much the history of our islands on how uh, uh, land was always seen as some sort of real estate or some sort of inventory of, of what crops could be benefited from um, within these, uh, to, to supply the global food chain, you know, to, mm -hmm. to supply the global demand for, for products that can be grown here. Uh, not just... Yeah, sorry. No. No, you go. Finish no, 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 but I was going to go to the next one. But then, yeah. Okay, no, you have I was one? interested about it. I mean, I open up too many um, topics, but I mean, the Jesus of Nazarino, like oh, this right, person, right, right. like um, and I encountered this person and the festivities around Jesus Nazarino, right, like quite yeah, often yeah. by my time on the Philippines. So yeah, maybe yeah. you can also say some sentences uh, about. All right, all right. Okay, so actually now that I'm looking at this work that I did, I'm trying to figure out like why I put Jesus Nazareno particularly um, as a backdrop to this. But I guess like it's more of like, because um, as a background, like Jesus Nazareno is like a, um, a revered um, image sculpture um, that people flock to as a pilgrimage uh, every January. Um, it's it's a really big phenomenon, but I think I put it there as a backdrop um, to sort of um, set as an example how, what do you mean, like um, faith is sort of like a, is, is put into one idea, you know, or one image. Mm -hmm. and how much power how much energy and how much like devotion um this one inanimate object um holds so with this sort of like i'm trying to i'm trying to sort of find ways on how this kind of like devotion and faith practice can be possibly geared towards um me for myself, like larger issues, mm -hmm. such mm -hmm. as like peasant struggle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm trying this... to sort of, I'm, I'm trying to sort of steal its power. I'm, yeah, okay. By putting it there at the back background, I'm trying to steal its power and and put the it put its power onto the front, which is like mm. uh, some okay. some some rice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because the story about Jesus Nazarene is something about uh, that he came on a ship and the ship burned or something. Was there something? Yes, yes. And then that's why he became dark. Yeah, um, exactly. And yeah, but, there is also this. And yeah. then it's, it was the only thing that survived, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm, no. so this, I guess that's mm -hmm. how I would sort of like um, choose objects to put into these and try to sort of make some sort of logic into the themes that I'm trying to make. Yeah. Here in the second box, we have like, this is a typical anting anting talisman or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that in that second box, I guess I'm it's second talking box. about, like, yeah, and in the second box, I'm talking about like a mineral extraction, which is uh, another of one of the biggest contradictions in Philippines because like we are one of the top, um, we have one of the like largest uh, gold deposits and also copper and nickel so we have enough copper and nickel to to industrialize five times over but we've never had access to our own ores because mm -hmm. of neoliberal policies that prevent us from 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 
industrializing or to developing the industry to process the ores. So um, it's mostly foreign multinationals yet again who mine our lands, who extract the ores, and then just sell everything back to us as finished products. Mm -hmm. So the very idea that nails for construction or needles for sewing like every little thing is imported but then the raw material comes from our islands from the so i guess like that was, that's pretty much the main part knowing how min how mineral extraction or extracting from the land um and how the people itself do not uh, benefit from this kind of uh, resource it's always been because of of a uh, colonial power and how how local, like the local ruling class is co-opted by, by capitalist or imperialist agendas. Exactly, but the new oh, yeah. colon colonial power or new colonial power is also like coming from the Chinese side, right? The, yeah, the third box, yeah. we have the, the Chinese checkers in the middle. Mm -hmm. But then it has Captain America's shield right smack in the middle, no? Mm -hmm. So I guess oh, yeah. like, um, um, regardless of who the the imperialist states are, it's more of like this this entire system on what makes all of this possible. No, I mean, if we oust this dictator now, it's gonna be replaced by another puppet strongman dictator that will like sway to to the influence of U.S. imperialism or Chinese imperialism, mm -hmm. um, for that matter. Um, but yeah, I guess like it looks, it's very predominantly Chinese because of this huge Chinese checkers, which I've had for years and I've just been wanting to use for work. But I mean, I here think, we also have in the force box, we have the. Yeah, with the spam and the Coca Cola uh, and all yeah, these things. Yeah, but also the yeah. Hong Chao Bai Kui, the, yeah, the ribs Maling. in red sauce. <laughs> and the Maling. So it's pretty much like a collage of objects, like a, mm -hmm. a bricolage or a, an assemblage, um, which which I myself am trying to sort of like uh, piece things together, like I said, to make a coherent, logical thing and in a way also present it in such a way that it's like a domestic thing. It's a cupboard. Yeah. Sorry, it's 12 o'clock. The sirens are going on in Austria at 12. I just Ooh. want to mute myself. I don't know. Do you hear it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. okay. Just let me know if, like, I'll just like follow like your. Um, no, then I also would like to know about the, um, the last box about the picture collage, the photograph collage right. you have in it. Is it like about the Philippines itself and the status of how family and the importance family has in uh, Philippine society, or how could um, I no, understand? Actually, this? Um, no, actually, um, yeah, um, so I'm I'm approaching this from an idea of like labor, like um, mm -hmm. so other than than crops that are exported and exploited and then minerals that are that are extracted and exported and exploited uh -huh. and and uh, military and political dominance and like the captive market with the spam like the the people here and then this last box i'm sort of talking about labor or people or people okay. themselves yeah. as a resource you know like um within the past couple of decades like an immense number of filipinos have become overseas workers in different countries to serve us to serve us like a domestic help or or, or other blue collar jobs like um, seamen or 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 clerks or engineers mm -hmm. so even even the scientists we produce are sort of forced to uh, that graduate from the Philippines are sort of forced to move abroad because there's no real work as a scientist here because there's no there's not much work here. We're pretty much like uh, receivers of 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 excess from larger imperialist states. So there's this like constant uh, systemic drain of people because there's very little there's very little um, like opportunity here but mostly because of like neoliberal policies that prevent um, prevent um, I guess the Philippines from from giving real jobs or at least job security or livelihood or, or opportunities for the people so it sort of talks about like how yeah how, how labor is exploited this this Latin. Yeah.
with a time mm. with a timer and then the all the Red Bull and power drinks. And <laughs> yeah, okay, now I get it. Yeah, okay, of <laughs> course, the Red Bull power drinks. But um, what you're talking about now about the neoliberalism, the neoliberalism that is um is so strong on the Philippines and that like kind of doesn't provide work for its own people who are living there. I know that there's like also people going to home to Hong Kong, for example, for domestic works right, right. or um. Or like also like I remember many people learning in German to come here as domestic workers, mm. you know, like that's mm -hmm. the thing they would go through to learn German so they can find work here in a German speaking mm. country. Yeah. But in the works you have shown at the Berlin Biennial 11, you go into this, um, the middle one is called the Tropical Tarot Tapestry. You are pointing out the current regime's military enclaves as well as the topological overview of different counterinsurgency programs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. currently being waged against the Filipino people themselves, mm -hmm. like in a very outspoken and direct manner, I would say. Like yeah. while you you were using Dagalog in the maps before, and like mm -hmm. as you're just telling us about what all these symbols mean. In this work's tropical terror tapestry, you use English as language, and you are quite straightforward, mm -hmm. putting the facts, you know, with mm -hmm. the uh, with the texts you're writing, but also with the image and Im mm -hmm. imaginal images. So maybe, and then there's also the QR codes in the work. So yeah. maybe you can briefly also. I just I took out this this part of the. Um, of Ch about China, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and uh, and the uh, China, the South China Sea. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you can also elaborate. Elaborate, or, or do you have to leave at twelve? Actually, because it's. I'm fine. I'm fine. It's okay. up to you guys, but I can. I can stay. All right. Wait, wait a moment, Severin. There's one more question. All right. Oh, I, I see. Also, should be. I think uh, um, Cian is looking at it. Yeah. Okay, I'll go for this. I'll go for this question first from Marco Retsuko. Yeah. Yes, go. No, I cannot see it because I'm I'm sharing okay. the I'm splitting right, the screen right. and that's why I right. otherwise I would read it because yeah. that would be the my yeah. task as okay. a host. But so I'm asking you. No problem. I'll, I'll read it. I'm reading it. So it says like, um, what can you say about cultural appropriation, particularly how can we artists borrow or incorporate culture without disrespecting the culture or while being able to observe ethics so as not for artists of probably bourgeois background to be an exploiter of other cultures as well. Um, scroll down. Do artists like ask for letters or are we able to just borrow inspiration as long as we are from a country? Do you, what do you think about this? All right. Um, hmm. I think all cultures are appropriated anyway. You know, and like it's a matter of like, do, do you, I mean, everything is reappropriated and um, um the the question is like what do you get out of it no i mean is it like fast fashion adopting like a uh a particular pattern from a tribe or weave from a tribe to make like something out of it or or the thing i mentioned a while ago is like the chinese fake uh, the fake chinese um like uh, traditional weaves that are sold online. I mean, there are sort of like boundaries onto that, but in contemporary art, as long as you, you think your work is not exploitative, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong there. Um, it's more of like like the ideological background of, of, of how you go about and using images. I mean, I think my works are uh, appropriate culture but then like how I do it I think like I'm trying to appropriate cultures of privilege as well <laughs> um, so these works in Berlin for example I'm using a lot of um, imagery from from the military institution like I don't I'm not sure if like I mean the those those seals and emblems are actual uh, are reference from actual um, like a uh, departments or offices or, or, or centralized bodies like the army the navy the air force the department of national defense like i'm appropriating their images and then subverting them so i'm not sure if that falls within like 
um, disrespecting their culture, but then if anything, like I am disrespecting their culture. <laughs> I am deliberately mocking them because I am angry. Um, but, but you're so speaking I, about about this. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, speaking this, about that the, one. The, yes. the embroideries that are in there are yeah, taken yeah. from. Can you repeat it? Yeah, taken. They, they are actually the the seals of of uh, different military bodies. Uh -huh. Yeah. So basically, this particular monster that I that I superimposed onto the archival image is another made-up image. Um, but pretty much I, I wanted to sort of um, uh, imagine the chain of command as a, from the president to the foot soldiers. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to imagine that chain of command as a monster, you know, as this like hybrid monster. So like the chain of command, the commander in chief of the military is the president. You know? But then the president also sort of like sways its its allegiance to different imperialist states. Mm -hmm. um, underneath it is like like the Department of National Defense and all its other offices. There we go. And then the the, the Philippine Army with its like uh, the armed forces of the Philippines and its three branches: uh, the, the Navy, the Air Force, and then the Army. Mm -hmm. The Army is like in the center crotch area. That one. And then oh. below below that. But that one. Yeah, and then like below it are the like spider-like legs, which mm -hmm. uh, has letters. It spells like Kafgu, and then Kafgu, C A F G U, Kafgu. Mm -hmm. So Kafgu um, is the para the the foot soldiers, but they're like the paramilitary. They're civilian auxiliary force, mm -hmm. um, geographical unit, uh, if I'm not mistaken. It's like a it's like the army of an army, you know, like foot soldiers that they they make from 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 villagers that they sort of like coerce into mm -hmm. into taking up arms and fighting with them to sort of like defeat um, the rebels. Because um, throughout the history of of the armed forces of the Philippines, wherein wherein U.S. is the primary patron, by the way, um, there has there has been very like other than like world Japanese occupation in World War II, there's no like conflict with uh, foreign um, aggressors or intruders. So there, the Philippine army's main idea for enemy is is insurgency from within. That's why um, counterinsurgency is actually the main project of of the the military or the military institution. It's pretty much their fetish because they're wanting to. They're wanting to find the enemy within their own like uh, land or boundaries. So, I mean, I mean, going back to cultural appropriation, maybe by talking about the culture and history of of uh, of the military institution of the Philippines, I am reappropriating it and appropriating, maybe deliberately misappropriating it. Um, but then, what's What's stopping me? No. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I get. I guess it depends on like the angle of appropriation and misappropriation or reappropriation that that would. Uh, Does this answer uh, the question, Marco? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Um, maybe, but let's go back to this work because I think it's the first time yeah. also that I saw that you work with print on like taking this picture. I, as far as I read, uh, it's an US soldier from the early 20th century and it's also yeah, a picture yeah. you took out of the army archive, I guess. Yeah. So, and he, and this is this is also a big, like a photograph that you put on print. I don't know, maybe you can like mm -hmm. Briefly speak about the photographs where you took them from, what we can sure, see on it, or sure. whom can we see on it, and what's sure. the situation? Okay. <clears throat> so um, lately, I've also been sort of looking into um, colonial photographs um, from the early 1900s, mostly from the um, like, uh, American occupation before like the, the Commonwealth government. So it was the Philippine American War. Um, but this wasn't exactly a war because it was pretty much like a, a takeover or yeah, like a <clears throat> massacre, if you will. Um, so looking, uh, using images of that time as reference to talk about like today's like uh, struggles and contradictions in societies. Um, so, so the other one in particular with a monster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's an, an Igorot from the Cordilleras. Um, uh, employed as a 
as part of the Philippine Constabulary or like the first, like a like a police system. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing to want wanting to play around with is like dynamic of a of a, a native soldier, you know, like because they had to employ, they had to employ and train soldiers from within because those these are the people who knew the land. So I guess like I'm interested in that layer of 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 putting power onto like a to to people from the ground to sort of like somewhat police their own you know mm-hmm. so the idea of like fabulous exploits or like native mercenaries um, these are all sort of like part and parcel of the whole military narrative the colonial narrative of the Philippines and other global south countries it's a it's a colonial tactic you know to mm-hmm. To, to employ local assassins or local mercenaries and make an army out of them. Mm-hmm. And it's much the same as how paramilitaries are formed as well. Mm-hmm. You know, so, I mean, paramilitary is like, um, are the ones who are actually made to do um, the dirty work of the soldiers, if you will. You know? So there, there are different, like private armies and, and, and uh, yeah, these paramilitaries are also somewhat like, um, controlled or, or, or bought and sold by like the local elite, if you will. Mm-hmm. And then usually are used to protect uh, investments or corporations of mm-hmm. uh, like uh, mining tenements. There would be like a military, like a few military encampments surrounding and protecting mining tenements. Yeah, because those are pretty much uh, the targets of, of um, insurgents, if you will. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I thank so much for sharing all that knowledge with us um, here behind your uh, your work. Um, it's super interesting and fascinating. But I feel like with everything we could like keep on speaking like for five yeah. hours. So yeah. sorry, also to listeners, it's just like a short <laughs> yeah. um, insight into your work. But ask questions if you can, because I think if you want to, I think we we have like another ten minutes left. Because sure. Should, yeah. We usually open the gallery now, and I think there's already people who want to see the exhibition. I mean, it's okay. We can, like, um, as a last point, I would like to, um, I would like to go to the work you do in the workshop. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Workshops. Okay. Um, because all the work you also seem to do is like it seems to be like really. Um, there's always this activist approach, and also I remember when we when we met, you were also. Sp- speaking a lot about um, yeah about this activist approach and when I was going to Bacchio in the north of Manila you were immediately like um, hooking me up with a human rights association there to who work for the or like who, who work with the Igorots or to <laughs> to have help them save their land from Chinese taking over you know Mm-hmm. And so you're really involved in this and some things when you, sometimes when you speak about your art, it also seems like as if it's a, rather something that you would bring onto the streets, you know, like, mm-hmm. um, so I would like to ask him, and it's probably a question that you get a lot, uh, if you would see yourself as an activist, is the activist again that decoupled from your artistic practice? Or when thinking about your workshops, you're doing with indigenous people, as we said, are the artistic works, as you said yourself, now I also remember mm-hmm. it, I read it in an interview. Mm-hmm. Is this just a vibe, is the artistic work just a byproduct of your actual activist work? So I think that we would like to point out as a last question to, mm-hmm. to wrap it all up and wrap it all up and bring it into a, um, yeah, no. I, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> but no, it's okay, I get it, I get it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So maybe I've first, been, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been trying to like word and reword that, uh, that question, uh, the answers to that question, like, like continuously, I guess, like, because there's no like one constant uh, way on how to answer. I mean, taking on labels or titles or 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 responsibilities mm-hmm. as artist or as activist or as any other, um, like. Like yeah, title, um, but I think I am trying to do it in such a way wherein it's all one in the same. Um, as as an artist, like I take on this role as, like hey, yeah. Um, so it's all <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, 
Um, so it's all simultaneously happening. And, and if anything, like one has to sort of recognize the limitations of one particular uh, branch of work and not just make up for it in the other side of it, but um, try to constantly make it coherent. So I'm, I'm speaking, for example, with like um, making objects and showing in galleries and museums. I mean, these objects, these, these textile works that I make, uh, these embroidered textile works there, they won't, that, it, 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 it doesn't fit in, in a protest because it's just one thing. I mean, it's, it, it's like a banner, but then it's not like people are going to be walking the streets and looking at the map. Hello, yeah, there. I think I was muted for a while. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, right. All right, all right. It's not that yeah. you're walking the street with the banners walking the streets. Right, that right. That was the last thing. Yeah, okay. So so I, I'm making these objects. Um, sorry. Sorry, hold on, hold on. What do you need? Okay, wait, mommy will do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not, um, it's so, not, it's not primarily about walking the streets with the banners. It's more like yeah. there is this content, you know, where you yeah. would like to bring it on the streets. And so, um, so like, I, I am, I'm like, aware that these the, the space for these particular things are for museums and galleries but then it more than more than the objects themselves it's like the narratives that these objects carry i think which are more important and which should which should take different iterations other than objects that are to be displayed visually so i think the information the the the, the stories uh, the narratives and then it's it's very presence should have um, a version in an easily distributable more pedagogical and accessible format so I think I'm thinking like these these workshop maps that I've been doing um, are not just like for me to extract stories from but wait, the people. This, yeah. this workshop maps you are doing. What 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 are oh, you yeah. doing in these workshops? Who are you doing all right, these all workshops right. with? I think many people here maybe don't know it. Oh yeah, yeah. I just jumped into it now. <laughs> <laughs> so like, so I've been doing I've been doing these like a uh, counter mapping workshops with different communities since 2017, and then like I, it's like a storytelling workshop, um, wherein they tell their stories with the maps that they draw. Uh, but then it's not always um, it's not always myself teaching them how to represent their space, but it's more of um, reintroducing the format of a map to orient their themselves not just in space but in the social conditions that they experience. So um, I, it's not like a quantifiable kind of uh, exercise wherein like. Um, like the distances between things, but more of like how they articulate their own personal narratives in relation to struggle and and like land disputes or human rights violations. So um, but in, it, this, it, in this, with these yeah. five maps that we are having here, what is the mm -hmm. precise example of these five maps? I remember it's from the All right. universe. Yeah. So, so for, for this one in particular that we're seeing now, okay. <clears throat> this is um, within the, this is in a river. Uh, in the boundary of Quezon and Tanay province in, in, in like east of Manila, wherein there's uh, uh, the, the state is wanting to build a large dam using Chinese loans. It's a Kaliwa River and a Kaliwa Dam uh, project. Um, and then in the site where they will be building this dam eh, are different uh, communities national minority, uh, indigenous and peasant communities um, all together, it will flood um, several hectares, several hundreds of hectares of, of land and displace all of these communities and affect food security. Um, this is so, supposedly to supply Metro Manila uh, with more water um, because it's constantly uh, getting denser because there's a lot of people from the countryside moving into Metro Manila because that's where work are work is and and opportunities but at the same time it's also um yeah like privatizing water further so the different companies or contractors who are who are building or investing on this is uh, will pretty much be the sole beneficiaries of of these um new 
uh, reservoirs that they're wanting to make. But then it's also going to like uh, drastically affect the ecological balance of the area because it's a watershed uh, as it is. So it's it's like um, privatized water that we don't really need. Um, it's also like a big band-aid solution to the underdevelopment of the countryside, which is why people from the countryside are wanting to get into the city. Um, so yeah, it's it's. So this particular map is made by one of the chieftains of one of the communities that will be what one of the, um, what? One of the what? chieftains okay mm -hmm. chieftains of one of the communities that will be submerged in water. Um, in there, he he's pretty much narrating like what 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 the river means to them, mm -hmm. and and what else they what else they um, like um, experience and see um in the vicinity of their 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 land as as the as the dam construction continues mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. yeah okay um so yeah i mean it's a lot to translate but basically um it's it's a counter narrative to what uh, to what the development company and then what the state sort of a uh, um explains or shows it to be you know i mean yeah. like for all these like new developments like corporations would would uh, sell us these ideas of like the new sustainable the uh, like spaces of the future and all these stuff but then what they don't want us to know is all the like the disposition and then the displacement and the, the aggression that actually ensues to to make these fantasies come true the mm -hmm. fantasies that they are forcing us to buy mm -hmm. basically yeah. yeah um yeah so that's that's this map and then okay so this map in particular also um is a narration of uh, of a sagai nine massacre so like in october 2018 there was a massacre in um in a bunkalan or like a collective communal farming uh area within a sugarcane plantation so like uh, armed goons with high-powered guns like shot uh in the evening like shot at like a, a tent of like a resting farmers who are doing this um collective communal farming which is actually like a form of resistance to to plantations and so nine people died um that night and still up to today there's no like justice for yeah. it and it's actually it's actually like a it's an ongoing thing these kinds of uh of events so we're trying to not um, not just have these events as statistics, um, but actually have like more personal, have more like try to get more personal narratives into into how we un understand these kinds of nar narratives. So th this particular map was made by a survivor of of that massacre. Um, he just happened to like walk out of the of the hut. Um, to, to charge his phone in the other house and then that happened and um, so there are these narratives as well that sort of show like you know the 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 violence the aggression the terror and the trauma that different the, the different communities face like peasants and indigenous um, communities so that was in 2018 but then there's been more and then it's, it's a continuing like it's a continuous thing that happens here in the Philippines, which I think is like the mo one of the most important things we should be talking about, actually. Yeah. So, but, I, but, yeah. but it's all like, I mean, how long does the Duterte, is he like, like Xi Jinping, like a uh, leader of a lifetime or how is Duterte <clears throat> doing at the moment? His term ends in 2020 and I think like, mm -hmm. like 2022. Ah, okay. 20, yeah, and then um, like someone else from his crew is gonna run, um, but it's not, it's not so much like who who will be the next pre. I mean, it will be who, will, but then, as long as it's more like the system, you know, it's it's more of like how how this feudal and bureaucrat capitalist and imperialist system persists. Like yeah. people, this is gonna keep happening regardless of who's the president. Mm -hmm. It's more of it, we need to get an overhaul. And this is the, precisely the thing why people take up arms. Um, people take up arms not just because they're disillusioned and, and confused. People take up arms because 
they are forced to, they are cornered, and fighting back is their only way of survival. And unless we see it as that, and not just some like some lousy civil war that we've been having, it's actually not just um, like a war on ideology, but it's also a war on survival. Mm-hmm. And then it's it's not a very popular thing to to view it as a civil war, but it's actually been happening for like more than fifty years here in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. There's a protracted people's war in the countryside. And what we really need to know is what are the what are the roots of this of this armed struggle? You know, so we, we need to look into the narratives of the people to find out and to understand why there is fighting. You know, there's landlessness, there is food insecurity, and there is the exploitation of labor and resources and all of the above. So, yeah, these these are the sort of stories from the ground that spell out these bigger things of neoliberal policies and imperialism. This is the, I guess, like, these are stories drawn on maps um, showing the spaces of, like, yeah, like trauma, but struggle and survival. And, there, and there's also, like, uh, I, I don't know, as I experienced it in my short time in Manila, there is uh, quite an um, art, artist movement or community who really like working on all these um, issues and working with people and through be it through documentary movies or as you do yeah. with your workshops and stuff so yeah um, I think in this case art slash activism can also be um, it should be one in the same it's not exactly two things separate. exactly yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. good strategy to reach out to people to find out more and also like getting in dialogue and like because when speaking about it, things get more clear and understandable. But yeah, wow, what an insight. Um, are there more questions from the audience? No. There's one in the chat. Box. There's it's one in the nice. chat. Uh, should we ask this? Oh, okay, right. What? Yeah, okay. No question? No, I don't think, yeah, I don't think it's a question. Yeah. So okay, yeah. Um, I would love to wrap it up somehow, but <laughs> it's um, it's been a lot, and I just am, um, and I hope to see you again soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah, because it's always such a pleasure to hear about your work and the um, things you are involved in and the thoughts you have about it because like i mean i'm here in innsbruck it's like i mean europe is going more far right than ever you know Mm, mm. but (laughs) it's still um yeah like just also being on the philippines for the two months was also very interesting for me because there's this whole system you know i mean you don't read it in the news kind of you know you don't read yeah it in yeah it's a so your art is a way also of understanding and approaching about also the colonial history that is still bothering the philippines so deeply like this this is so rooted and is uh, destabilizing the country still and the neo imperialism which was especially interesting for me because i lived in china for such a long time mm. and seeing how china is like interfering there also with the drug of wars i think right i mean most of the drugs are actually coming from china as far as i read mm-hmm. somewhere and then but to that is calling for the drugs of war so it's all like interlinked interlinked and so <laughs> complex yeah. so that we cannot yeah. really we cannot really wrap it up or grab it you know like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, mean, I guess um yeah i mean as, as a wrap-up <laughs> uh like, like this is me from the Philippines making art about stuff that's happening here, and then like, um, I guess what I like, I want to end with, like, a positive. Also, yeah, no, no, also expressing solidarity with other people, not just from the Philippines, who are going through the same things, um, and facing the same contradictions and, and the same struggles, and I think these this is the best uh, no this is like one way on how we can like like together and like get through this is in solidarity uh mm-hmm. with each other so like in in the in the yeah in the in these avenues um art being one of many others 
um, is a way for us to share each other's stories and like um, yeah hopefully like there's more of this and then there's stronger solidarities and we just need to keep like uh, looking out and checking in with each other no yeah and uh, yeah i mean this is how we're gonna do this simultaneously across the globe and and then so be it and we fight in our own streets we fight in each other's streets and each, each other's live streams and then yeah yeah that was a beautiful wrap-up thanks for that yeah okay in solidarity with each other and let's keep on exchanging yeah yeah, yeah. Done. <laughs> Thank you, Sian. Thank you, Petra. <laughs> thank you for everyone in the gallery. And thank you for all the listeners. I mean, if you have any questions or further whatever, so you can just get my contact from the gallery. Yeah, and we will also put that the talk is will still be online, I think, for a week on Facebook. And in, in, during the next couple of days, we will also put it on Vimeo because I think there mm -hmm. is also a lot of details that maybe somebody wants to listen into it again. and. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Petra. Thank Bye. you. Bye.